Hello. I didn't see you there. Just finishing what we call a Texas lunch. Lunchy, lunchy lunch. I love lunch. So we have a couple of housekeeping items that I want to run by you. First of all, uh, hope you enjoyed the lunch and the networking opportunities in the lounge. I met up with some old friends that I haven't seen in a while, and I thought that that was fantastic. Secondly, uh, be sure to refresh the feed so that the um, broadcast that you're going to see will also sync up with the name of the presenter that we will be introducing next. And that brings me to my introduction of Jamie Maria Chauvin. She is the CSO of a company called Deity. And Jamie, like me, Jamie Maria is addicted to e-commerce, in love with code, and her mind bound to business. She's driven by the urge for innovation, and she fights with the aim to improve the online world around her. Starting as a native app developer who jumped into e-commerce, she co-founded Deity, with which she is on a mission to spark an online revolution to evolve web technologies to the use of new architectures and PWA solutions. It gives me a tremendous amount of pleasure to bring to the virtual stage Miss Jamie Maria Chauvin. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for the great introduction. I'm very, very happy to be here. I'm very sad to not be in New York at this time, uh, but at least I can join uh, you and, and share some of my knowledge with you on this virtual stage. Uh, that's what I'm going to do. Uh, today I'm going to talk to you about software architectures and uh, going wild, actually. And um, as you just mentioned, my name is Jim Maria Schauer, and I co-founded uh, Deity. And while we talk about software architectures, I'm really going to ask you to wear some sunglasses because it's going to be pretty well. So, so first of all, it's 2020. And while we were saving the world in 1944, we are saving the world now by being on our phone. The apocalypse is here and we are at home on our phone. That's how we are at the moment saving the world. And we can actually see this in numbers. If I look at this chart uh, by Cloudflare, uh, it's very interesting to see how the internet traffic has been growing immense, tremendously, uh, starting somewhere from uh, February. I'm pretty sure it's still up to date. These numbers are until April, but I'm pretty sure if we put up these numbers right now, they look kind of the same. And uh, we not only see this in the internet users, we really see this in the e-commerce as well. Uh, the total online spending was 82.5 billion in May in one month. That's a 77% year-to-year growth compared to last year. Uh, not only is this amazingly high, uh, but it's also a jump that is predicted to happen only in five years. So just imagine we have been growing our e-commerce in one year, which was predicted in five years. This has been great for many e-commerce shops, but it also has been a very big strain on our systems. And to survive, we need fires. So what do I mean with that? This is something that I call the fire principle. And the fire principle is the way to survive your online business uh, for these huge traffic amounts, but also for the demands we're gonna have in the future. To survive your business, you're gonna need to be flexible. Your software needs to be able to, to, to so you can build with it whatever your business needs. Like if it should be a front end, if it should be different back ends, you should be, have the flexibility to build with no restrictions on either design or, or functionalities. You also should be integratable. There are very, very great uh, services out there at the moment. And many times I still hear, oh, we cannot integrate, we cannot use that because the software cannot do that. And we should not have that. There are so many great software services out there. There's so many data sources out there. We should be able to have the freedom to integrate them. We also should obviously be very reliable. If you go offline, that's something we don't want. We don't want the shops to go down. We should be able to keep up uh, our performance without having any uh, trouble with any amount of traffic. Then we should be extensible. We need to be able to extend and, and, and add new features. This, this market is growing so fast and it's so much changing every single day. We should be able to extend in a very quick way without adding any complexity to our software system. So we do not have to, we, we don't get in trouble as soon as we grow. And last but not least, we need to be scalable. Uh, we need to make sure that we can scale unlimitedly on every single side of the game, back or front end. Unfortunately, the scalability is kind of a problem. The flexibility of most websites is like vodka. It's not flexible at all. And why this is, I'm, I'm going to talk you through uh, some uh, wh why this is happening. And that really has to do with the software architecture. And for that, I'm going to walk you through a little bit of software architecture history and what is happening there. We have the old and the gold monoliths. The old and the gold monoliths, this is one of the most basic software architectures where everything is very tightly coupled. 
We have the UI layer, the data layer, the processes, everything stitched together. It looks a bit like this. Um, so the presentation layer, the business logic, the data interface is there, it's all stitched together. If you want to change somewhere, uh, for example, in the business logic, you're really gonna have to take care of all the other business logic. It might have some influence. It could be that you're pressing a button and then the presentation layer goes down, etc. Obviously, there's some pros uh, to monoliths. And the pros of monoliths are mainly that the application is packaged and deployed as one. There's another pro that's pretty simple to develop, pretty simple to deploy, as you only have one package to deploy. Simple to test, simple to maintain, but only if you keep the application simple. And in most cases, monoliths are not being used for only simple applications. I've seen, I've seen some really, really big shops running on monoliths and which, which are having a lot of trouble. That's why we have some cons of the monoliths. Monoliths are hard to extend and maintain. As soon as you get big, and there's a lot of things happening in your monolith, you're going to have some trouble with extending and, and maintenance. Monoliths are not flexible. You cannot easily switch or, or add something new. You, you need to really look at your whole system every single time and take care of the system. Monoliths are not very reliable. If you go down, you go down. Everything goes down. And still, most of the modern internet is a monolith. One example we saw recently, and I'm sorry, uh, Magento, but there was this issue where they say, you know, when you have an admin user and you have the role scope restricted by website, performs operations and admin panel, for example, just logging in or, or saving a product, then the Magento rebuilds the whole cache. And in that case, it could lead to site outage. And I think that should not be possible. It should not be happening that if someone is just logging in or changing something and you have high traffic at the moment that your whole website goes down because someone is logging into your backend panel. I'm like, yeah, this should not be happening. But we can solve that. And Magenta is actually a very good way of solving this. And, and what we do, we go wild and we go headless. And what do we mean with that? The front end in a headless solution, the front end is decoupled from the back end and connects via APIs. The key here is the decoupling of the front end, and the front end no longer depends on the back end services. So it depends, but it's not interwoven. So it looks something like this. We have the presentation layer, separate from the business logic. The data interface is still there together, and then there is the database. The business logic is still one, so in your business logic, you still have some complexity there, but at least your presentation layer is safe. You can communicate the presentation layer. There's some pros of this. Front end is not depending on back end processes. There's performance advantages. Your front end is very scalable and reliable. The front end is also more flexible and more integratable, and developers can work in separate teams. However, for the last two years, I've been hearing something weird. When people talk about headless, most of them also immediately think, wait, but what is about PWAs? Is PWA headless? And I think we should find the answer for that. When I look at a PWA, a PWA basically is nothing more, and, and it's pretty cool, let me say that, but it's nothing more than, than a set of tools or a set of functionalities. It's a it's together, it, it's the same thing as a native app and a responsive website together. It has all the cool stuff of the native app and it has a cool stuff of the responsive app. And we have a progressive app app. Things like push notifications, installable home screen, full screen experience, but also at very high speed. We can have a very reliable and very fast uh, progressive app app. And that's very important, and especially in e-commerce, as we know that 53% of users abandon a page if it takes more than three seconds to load. Online, that's very long. Offline, it looks stupid. 3.2 seconds, I mean, it's ridiculous if you're going to leave and do not want to wait for it, but it's happening. 3.2 seconds only, and 53% of your visitors are gone. And now you might think, you know, I'm a great web developer, 3.2 seconds is not going to happen to me. But... 19 seconds is the average mobile web page load on 3G. And not just on 3G, 19 seconds. On 4G, it's 14 seconds. It's not even that, that much big of a difference. But if you look at the whole world, you might think 3G is, is you know, that, that's low or that's high. I mean, we in Europe, and especially where I am, we have a lot of 4G. Uh, but the main part of the world, 60% is still on 2G, actually. And I cannot even imagine the numbers there. But what happens if you if you speed up? So what happens if you use this PWA technology? What, what does it do for your shop? And uh, one of the platforms that used it uh, is Tinder. And, and I'm pretty sure I don't have to explain what Tinder does, and especially not during this COVID times. I think a lot of people are looking on Tinder. Um, but they were able to use PWA technology and were 7.22 seconds faster. They were 90% smaller. And with that, had more messages, more swipes, and longer sessions. This is a great, great advantage for them. Uh, but a bigger advantage even was by Uber. 
Uber used progressive web app technology and were able to load within three seconds on a 2G network. And if you think about that, that that's really, really interesting. Uber was not able to provide their services on a 2G network before. Now with progressive web app technology, they can load within three seconds. This means that 60% of the world on a 2G network is now accessible by Uber. And I'm pretty sure that maybe nowhere, there's the places where there's internet is bad, but I'm pretty sure almost everywhere in the world there are cars and there's people who need to go from A to B. So the core is only 50k GZ and they have a full new market opportunity for them. Another cool thing that you can do with Progressive Web App is that you can send push notifications, like these real push notifications you, you have on your phone that you normally get from apps. You can actually send from websites. And uh, not only will you be able to send commercials, that's nobody's waiting for that, but you can actually do some really cool stuff like this. Send them, send them animated gifts, send them all uh, very personalized messages just straight to the phone side. But what is a PWA? Technically speaking, a PWA is a service worker, is a web app manifest, and is HTTPS. Service workers is, is, is some JavaScript there, which is, which is making sure that you can do all these cool stuff like, like notifications and being offline, et cetera. And the web app manifest is a JSON file, which makes sure that you can download uh, the app on your home screen, install it, and, and there's some information there on what is the logo and what is the color. But the thing is that a PWA is not an architecture. A PWA can live in a monolith, and a PWA can live in a headless architecture. It doesn't matter. PWA is not headless. And PWA is no fires. PWA is not flexible. P PWA is not integratable by itself. PWA is somehow reliable, that is true. PWA is much more reliable. PWA by itself is not extensible and it's not scalable. To really look for the fires, we have to go one step further. And this is when we look at something that we call service-oriented architectures. And the service-oriented architectures, or in short, a SOA, decouples the front end and the back end. So the SOA brings the flexibilities, the extensibility, the scalability, and the reliability to both the front end and the back end. So how does that look like? It looks something like this. In the service-oriented architecture, you have a middleware which strongly connects uh, the data, and then you have multiple. You can have multiple presentation layers, and you have separate business services. One service could be search, one service could be payments, one service could be products, etc. Instead of sharing a single database, also every service can have its own database. So you can choose what technology you would like to use for every service. The big ingredient and the not so secret ingredient of this service is really this middleware. You need this middleware if you really want to build service-oriented architectures. This middleware connects all the dots between the systems and the services, but it also regulates where the data is coming from, where it should go to, and where the true source of data is. And mainly that one is important. You need to know where the true source of data is. If you're using multiple services, you need to know which one is defining the price, which one is defining the name of the product, etc. Uh, these processes uh, we can find in the middleware also include some authentication handlers and messaging systems to make sure that it goes to the right place. So some pros of going so well is that you have a lot of manageable services. Your services are pretty nice manageable. You have separate deployments, languages, database per service and per front end. It's very scalable and reliable, not just on the front end, but also per service. Very flexible and you can integrate anything directly to the middleware. It's very extendable without any complexity. As the service is a standalone, you can add any service and remove it later or replace it later. You have a fast adoption of new features and technologies, and you can work in distributed teams. You also have an increased productivity. Additionally, you can use existing services, like for example, Algolia, Agenda for Products, etc. So the SOA, this has the fire. Flexible, integratable, reliable, extendable, and scalable. Now, a SOA is pretty difficult to build. If you want to build it from scratch, it's going to take you a while. You need an architect for that. You need to really write down what you're going to do. You need to figure out the middleware. You need to figure out the services. You need to figure out the front end. You need to get the data from A to B, et cetera. So we as a company thought this could be different. What if we can offer a light version? What do we need? What if we offer a light version SOA? We need a middleware. We need some data integration parts. We need to be able to get the data in. And we need some basic services. And that is what we did within our company. We built a middleware that connects with different ecosystem industry partners, like for example, Magento, WordPress, Ogolia, that has some basic services on the right side, which really gives you some enterprise power, and it has some front ends on the left side. And to show you how fast this is and what is happening in this middleware, this interest. On the left side, 
I have a demo. So this is a demo site as a front end. What I'm going to do, I'm going to search for a product. As you can see in the top right, I'm searching this in the front end, in the PWA team. Then it's asking the server, the presentation server, for this information. And this presentation server knows this is a search. So I'm going to ask Algolia on the fully right side. The product is being appeared and I'm going to have some, some data there. Then on the right side of my screen, this is a backend of, of, uh, of big commerce, and I'm going to change a product price here. I'm going to save the product price. So the product is being saved in big commerce. There is no direct integration between big commerce and Algolia. The information is being sent to the presentation server, and the presentation server then knows to send this information to Algolia so the Falcon front end can use it. So I'm going to use now this search. I'm going to look for a clock. And the clock here is 89 euros. Now I'm going to change the price to 99. I'm going to save it. I'm not refreshing any cache. I'm not even refreshing my website. I'm going to search again, and the price is changed to 99. We only need the processing time here of 300 milliseconds. We do not even need to replace or refresh the website or do anything. No caching, nothing. We do not need to do anything to get this data there. And we can do this because we're using this very fast middleware to get this data to the right place. We believe that's the only way that you can actually fast move forward. So an example, if you want to build a shop, how will that look like? For example, you can do something like this. You have WordPress, which you're going to use for content. You want Elasticsearch for navigation and search. You want some products uh, which you build by feed from Google, and you have some Node.js there for social login, custom features, etc. As you can see in the middleware, everything is an extension. The content is an extension. The search is an extension. Products and custom features are extensions. As you can see, there is no complexity here. As every single thing is an extension, it can be really easy to maintain and also to replace. And then on the right side, you have this front end. This front end is extremely fast. I'm searching here for products. And the cool thing is I'm searching within a database of 7.9 million products. We tested it on 19 million products, 19 million products being loaded in with all different data sources coming together as one. There is no direct integration between the back end. It's a really a search as you type. As soon as I start typing on the laptop, you can see that also the URL, everything is changing and the products are very fast. There is a small white screen before the products appear. And this is something we had to build in deliberately because it was too fast and the people could not see the screen uh, changing, actually. The cool thing is that it was not only a very big and, and, and very, very fast project. The results were this. We had 7 million products. We have 0.063 seconds loading time. And the best part, we were able to build it within three months, starting from the designs. So within just three months, we could build this in a full SOA way because we have this super nice uh, middleware there. So if we, uh, if we put that together, I basically uh, have three main architectures. We have a monolithic architecture, a decoupled, and there is something called the service-oriented architecture. And um, I, I heard some uh, that Magento is moving into this part, and I saw some talks actually that, that are about this subject, and I think that's very interesting uh, that they're doing this, as this is really a great way forward. But which one is the best? I get this question quite a lot. Which one is the best now? And when I look at them, there's not really an answer to that. If you have a simple block, use the monolithic architecture. Don't go so it, that doesn't make sense. If you just you know have your WordPress then and your content, you want to tell your family how things are going or you want to tell, talk about your cooking, et cetera, use the monolith. If you have a B2C web shop, the headless is fine. Go. You know, don't 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 build all these these things that if you don't need it. You know, you you can you can go with the headless. You're gonna be fine. But if you want to do some multi-ex services, you need different backends. You need different services in the backend. You want to have different frontends. You want to have multi-store, multi multi language, multi etc. This is uh, when you're gonna need uh, this architecture, and not only for now, but you're gonna need it for the future, because to decide what your business needs is one of the hardest tasks. And to really take your time to do this and focus on the ambitions and not what you need today. If you're just going to build of what you're going to need today, you're going to get in trouble very, very soon. As we've seen now with the COVID, things can move very, very fast and your business can grow faster than you might think. Thank you very much uh, for your time, for listening to me. I wrote a blog about this as well. You can find this uh, via the QR code here. I also wrote once an article about the service architectures uh, for this uh, mage zine, for mage zine. And uh, Mage Zine, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Uh, it's a really great magazine. Uh, please have a look at it. There's some really great content there. Uh, part of it is about service oriented about architectures, but there's more great content there. Thank you very much. 
Fantastic, and thank you very much for that presentation. Um, we are in the Q&A right now live, so please take a moment to drop some questions into the uh, question and answer session for uh, Jamie Maria. So there are no questions at the moment. You did too good of a job. I tell you what, the, between <laughs> the, uh, the, the slide deck and the information, um, I think that uh, they learned a lot. I know that I did. Um, I've certainly, since the uh, beginning, I, I, I used to work for an, um, an SI in the Magento space that was working on uh, PWA content. And uh, from kind of the, the launch of the idea, I've always been enamored by it. I, I think it's absolutely fascinating. Um, certainly wicked fast. Um, I think the world is going to be migrating to headless technologies um, in the very near future just to try to, to um, hold on to their um, part of the uh, competitive landscape. Um, do you, what type of adoption are you seeing in the space for um, e-commerce sellers? How many people are, are already aggressively attacking this PWA um, uh, technology? Well, we've seen uh, quite, quite a few people now moving towards the PWA space. I think that the adoption was a little bit more slower than was predicted uh, by the big ones uh, like Forrester, etc. I think that the adoption of PWA gets a little bit uh, delayed. I do think that uh, what happened, because we were moving into the PWA, people started to look further than just the PWA and really started to move into this field of software architectures. Uh, so I think that that is that is something amazing, you know, because PWA is not just the solution. You need much more uh, than just the PWA. Um, I also think that some of the fears came from that. People were like, hey, but I, you know, I see this PWA and it's not smart problems. But it's because I need a little bit more than just the PWA. I also see that now with the COVID, we have seen uh, companies which were growing so fast and they were really struggling to keep up their business in the ferry fund in Europe about March. Uh, these companies now uh, were able to stabilize their business in the summer and now are coming back and saying, hey, you know, uh, this happened to me. Uh, I need to have a more future-proof solution. So I think that it's really accelerating at the moment. Much more people are moving into this field. Um, I think also the idea of headless has been adopted widely by bigger platforms. As before, you know, the many bigger platforms were like, hey, you know, you need to use my technology and only my technology. And now they're much more open to collaborate and have you know, this great ecosystem of great services out there and work together to get the best approach. There has been some uh, generalization in, uh, in this data so that we can easily uh, interact with all the different services. Fantastic. And so we do have a couple of questions here. Uh, the first one is from Karen says, what was the first website you showed us? And can you please share that link? Uh, the, 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 the website I showed you, webshop.nl. I can uh, definitely, I mean, I can share the link, but I think it's very easy to, uh, to remember, webshop.nl. Got it. And then uh, Rajnesh uh, says, to implement PWA or mobile app, which one is the best? Uh, yeah, well, that, that really depends on your project. I would say, you know, for, for, for the most general uh, consumer-facing apps, uh, you're, you're looking at PWA. I do not see anything why you're going to need a native app. You know, native apps might be very useful, for example, for hospitals who need certain services, who need really be secured on a phone. You know, you don't want to have on the browser uh, something very specific with some hardware that needs to connect. You know, this is when you're really going to need still your app. Um, but I do not see, for example, passport checking or that kind of stuff. But I don't really see any general uh, consumer facing things that you cannot use PWA for. I, it's the same as, as when we went to uh, to responsive websites. I mean, there was still there were still some people saying, hey, but I can make just a mobile website and a desktop website. And why it doesn't make sense. You can just use this, this, this hybrid thing that you can uh, do both. Beautiful. All right, folks. With the questions going once, going twice, sold. Thank you, Jamie Maria. That was a fantastic presentation, and uh, I hope, look forward to seeing the rest of the show, but um, this was probably my favorite so far, so thank you. Thank you very much. We'll see, see you, you at the next session. Uh, soon again. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>